And um, it, it happens that 13 is actually my birthday. So uh, the second one was 123, which happens to be January 23rd, which is actually my wife's birthday. Mm. Uh, but that was upon request. The third one was 313, which is actually March 13, which is my birthday. And that was also upon request. And uh, he gave me 133 to talk about science only in return for giving him 142 to talk about the meaning of life with 42 <laughs> being the answer. That's great. Right, <laughs> so, That's great. Uh, some hidden numerology behind yeah. the episodes, but uh, we had a deal of uh, probably four episodes after the first one. We're like, okay, listen, we have a few more things to say and uh, we'll, we'll see. You, anticip you anticipate going back and doing maybe five, six, seven? <laughs> uh, we might do a prequel. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like there's there's always more to say on on Lex's podcast. It's amazing, really. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to really talk about stuff that we don't often talk about as scientists. It's nice to sort of be able to indulge every now and then and just you know talk about life, which I think that's is right. Important. Yeah, science and life. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, that's what I'd love to do today. I mean, part of the reason why I'm sort of asking people to actually you know. Um, turn on their videos and say hi is because I'm actually here to answer questions. I'm actually here to hear from you guys and, you know, answer about the stuff that you care about. Because frankly, you can find plenty of two and a half hour lectures of me on the web <laughs> talking about my science, but how often do you get a chance to really just ask upfront your own questions? Yeah, I love that. That's great. Uh, as a kind, that, that's a nice kind of preamble to uh, to get us started, I love um, it. Yeah, so uh, it's just slightly after seven, and we have my my Zoom is showing five screens of people. This is a wonderful, wonderful turnout. Um, so it is my honor and privilege to uh, welcome you all to the uh, first of the, our natural and social science lecture series talks in the year 2021. It's our third talk in the academic year, our first of the calendar year. And I won't say too much more because I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, Professor Mark Jonas to introduce our, um, uh, our guest speaker. But I would just wanna say that our natural and social science lecture series has been going for uh, several years now. And it is funded by a generous grant from the Con Edison uh, uh, Company, which we're very grateful for. Uh, there will be um, two more lectures in the series this spring, one in March, one in April. The next talk is by Sarah Pearl Egendorf, uh, dealing with soils in New York City, com combining biological, geological, chemical, and sociological research having to do with environmental justice and soil for growing in urban gardens. So you'll get more information about that. Um, but tonight, our uh, featured guest, Manolis Kellis, will be introduced by my colleague in biology, Professor Mark Jonas. Thank you, Dr. Gaudio. And welcome everyone to 2021 Darwin Day. The first thing to know about Darwin Day is today is not actually the official Darwin Day. Darwin Day is uh, celebrated officially on February 12th. Uh, Darwin was born on February 12th in 1809. That happens to be Abraham Lincoln's birthday as well in the same year. The International Darwin Day is a celebration of Darwin's contributions to society and more broadly, achievement and progress in science since Darwin. It's commemorated by hundreds of academic institutions like ours with community outreach events like this one and is recognized by the United Nations and its members as a celebration of science and humanity. As I mentioned, it's typically celebrated in early February because uh, Darwin's birthday is February 12th. Here at Purchase, we've been celebrating D-Day since 2015. D-Days typically feature evening lectures showcasing cutting edge biological research that impacts society, culture, and human health in some way. I am incredibly excited and delighted that tonight we are joined by Dr. Manolis Kellis from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to give the 2021 Darwin Day Lecture. Dr. Kellis is 
principal investigator of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. He's member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. He's director of MIT's Computational Biology Group. And his projects and expertise span a wide range of research areas, including precision medicine, computational biology, machine learning, and disease genomics. And we'll hear a little bit about that today, disease genomics. Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, schizophrenia, obesity are just some of the diseases that Dr. Kellis studies. Dr. Kellis is also widely published and he's received numerous awards, including the US Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering, I think from uh, President Obama, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Award, National Science Foundation Career Award, and Technology Review Top Young Innovators Award. I discovered Dr. Kellis's work in the literature first, incredibly exciting and innovative work and synthetic work uh, that combines computation with uh, genomics um, and disease biology. But his work really came to life when I got a chance to listen to his exciting lectures and invited talks on YouTube. Dr. Kellis has posted, as far as I know, all of his academic lectures since early 2000s uh, on YouTube. And he has, at this point, dozens of invited lectures and interviews also on YouTube freely available. I was struck in, in particular by his four-part interview on the Lex Friedman podcast. If you're not familiar with this podcast, I, I invite you to check it out. On the podcast, I discovered Dr. Kellis's enthusiasm for communicating science to a general audience. I also discovered that Dr. Kellis sweet, uh, speaks several languages, including Greek, French, Spanish, and English. I don't know if that's an exhaustive list. Um, he also enjoys reciting Greek and French songs and poetry. And uh, you can listen to the Lex Friedman podcast to get a little flavor of that. And I have to say, having listened uh, to, at this point, several hours of Dr. Kellis's talks and interviews, he strikes me as one of the most brilliant and um, I have to say optimistic uh, scientists alive today. And with that, please help me give a warm purchase welcome to our 2021 Darwin Day Lecturer, Dr. Manolis Kellis. Welcome. Thank you really so, so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, um, I, I feel that uh, the legacy of Darwin is something that is uh, sort of really pervasive in our society, something that we should all, um, you know, I mean, again, the more you read about Darwin, the more you realize how incredible uh, his mind was and how amazing the advances were, uh, you know, relative to his time and uh, how, how broad of an impact he has had in the way that we think about you know, life and the position of humans in uh, the universe <laughs> in many ways. And uh, it's, it's really a lesson in humility to basically uh, read his work and truly understand how non-special we are. But it's through that embracing of uh, our scientific position in the universe that we uh, truly awesome, uh, see awesome, uh, also how awesome uh, humanity is in being able to, uh, to really understand uh, timescales beyond uh, our lives, to, to sort of really understand scales from the smallest to the largest, from the most ancient to the you know, future far, far beyond the lifetime of our planet, let alone our sun or uh, any, any of our lives. So it, I'm, I'm, I'm quite honored to be able to celebrate his legacy uh, in this way. So what I'd like to tell you about today is our quest in uh, translating genetic findings into therapeutic insights and specifically how we can uh, truly understand the circuitry of human disease at single cell resolution. And by understanding that circuitry, being able to actually manipulate that circuitry. So uh, I, I would like to actually start by dedicating this lecture to my auntie, Elise, and uh, Elena. So uh, Clea, unfortunately, doesn't realize when I'm uh, 
Oh, <laughs> when I'm giving uh, big scientific talks or just having a chat with my students. So, <laughs> Cleo, Cleo, please the button. And my son is practicing the piano downstairs. So certainly I don't have to travel, which is lovely. But then the downside is that you uh, get to experience my family life. And I don't know what I did to deserve that little, uh, you know, uh, kiss on the cheek. But um, I like to say that uh, our kids have, uh, on average, the appropriate uh, perception of their parents. Uh, right now, they think I'm God. Eventually, they'll think I'm the worst human being. And, you know, somewhere in the average will be my true worth. Uh, so anyway, uh, here's actually Anthony, who's also on the call. Uh, here's Elise, my auntie, and uh, Michael, my, um, my uncle, uh, who's, you know, the crazy biologist. Uh, that uh, inspired many of us uh, to go into science. Uh, my father, Ioannis, is uh, the oldest boy of the family, all children of Evriviki. And then uh, we have uh, in order Joachim, and then Michael, and then George. George is still alive and well and uh, reigning supreme in, in Crete. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, both uh, the older uh, sister and the rest of the siblings have, have passed. But uh, I want to start by showing you a snippet of my own genome. This is actually my DNA. This is, you know, one page of many, many pages of my DNA. Every single one of you has 3.2 billion letters of DNA in every one of your cells. If you put the DNA of one of your cells side by side, connecting all 23 pairs of chromosomes, you get two meters worth of DNA. And these two meters worth of DNA fit in every one of your trillion cells. If you put together the DNA of one person, even a tiny person, end to end, you will get not just to New York City from Boston, not just to the moon, you will get to Jupiter back and forth 10 times with the DNA of one person. So I want you to sort of understand the challenge of how to interpret that immense code fit into every one of our cells and making every single one of our cells act in different ways. And that's the challenge that the scientific society has taken on. But going back to my own DNA, I wanna focus on three letters out of three billion letters, three letters of my DNA. These are basically the worst parts of my genome. They predispose me to age-related macular degeneration. They basically increase my risk for AMD. It's a form of blindness whereby you lose the central part of your uh, vision as you age. And these findings are based on what we call a genome-wide association study. This is basically looking at every single nucleotide variant in the genome. So what is a nucleotide variant? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes and they contain 3 billion letters. But most of the letters have really never changed in the history of our uh, population. A tiny minority of letters, about one in a thousand, are commonly varying between people. What does that mean? That basically means that every single one of us is born with a unique genetic repertoire. And that unique ge genetic repertoire is made out of a combination of both common variants and, of course, rare variants. The common variants is what we are looking at here, and they are by far the easiest to study because you can just order a little kit for, you know, uh, $99 when it's on sale and get 6 million markings of your DNA to basically tell you where all of these genetic variants that are associated with disease take you from high risk to low risk. And this is just straight from the 23andMe website. Uh, you know, disclosure, <laughs> they are not funding me to show this. Um, so what do these variants do is the question. So some of them increase our risk and some of them decrease our risk. We discover them by carrying out a genetic test, test that basically asks for all of the people who have a T at this location or a C at this location, how many of them have age-related macular degeneration and how many don't? And that basically pushes these dots above or below this genome-wide significance line shown in red. 
What does that mean? That means that the correlation between inheriting this variant and having the disease is actually very strong. So it basically means if you have that variant, I can predict that you have a higher chance for the disease. And you will notice that there are dozens of these genetic loci. And that's not an exception. That's very much the rule. There are thousands of genetic variants that are associated with every single one of these traits that we take for granted, like how tall you are, how heavy you are, how good is your eyesight, how, uh, you know, what is the color of your hair? What is the color of your eyes? What is the color of your skin? What is the, um, your heart pressure, uh, your, your blood pressure, your heartbeat rate? Uh, the, uh, you know, there's this countless of physiological variables that are associated with common genetic variation. And there are also thousands of genetic variants that ever so slightly change our risk for disease. So this polygenic, which basically means many genes, this polygenic inheritance is at the root of genetics. And in this particular case, what my group is trying to do is understand the mechanism through which all of these genetic variants are leading to increased risk of disease. Number one, to quantify and predict the risk of disease for every person, but much more importantly, to understand the mechanisms underlying disease across all people. And in order to, in order to be able to use that knowledge to then better life for every person on the planet, regardless of, of whether you have or not this particular combination of variants. You can see from the highlights here that two of these variants perturb protein coding genes. So here's an ATG, every protein in your body begins with an ATG. And then you continue here, every three letters are translated into an amino acid and you have this ARMS2 gene Here's another protein coding gene. It also starts with an ATG. And you can see here this intron going from here all the way to there, and then the second exon. So introns are skipped when translating uh, mRNA into protein. So the translation starts here. And then this particular piece known as an intron is spliced out during the transcriptional process, co-transcriptionally and post-transcriptionally. It's spliced out. And in the end, you end up with a shorter mRNA, a shorter messenger RNA from the DNA that it started from that allows you to contiguously at the protein level translate from this mRNA into a protein. So these two perturb the amino acid sequence, but this one doesn't. So basically the big question for uh, you know, science is, great, uh, what is even the target gene for this variant? What does it do? Where is it? What cell type does it act in? What are the target genes that it controls? Who are the regulators that control it? Does it fall in a control region of the genome? And so on and so forth. So that's what my group does. And we do this not because you know, it's kind of fun and uh, interesting, which of course it is, but because in 93% of cases, these disease-associated variants do not perturb proteins they in fact fall in the vast non-coding regions of the genome. The human genome out of its 3 billion letters codes all of our 20,000 proteins in only 1.5% of our sequence. So out of those two meters, only 1.5% is in fact protein coding. The rest is these vast non-coding regions. And in fact, when the human genome project first started, a lot of people were wondering whether we should even bother sequencing these vast non-coding regions because we knew that a lot of them are made out of, out of repeats. And many people, many you know, prominent scientists expected that genetic variants would be falling in the protein coding portions. It was in fact very much a surprise that 93% of them fall outside protein coding genes. So what my group is trying to do is systematically study where those variants sit within non-coding DNA and how they're wired to their nearby genes. So we're going to be asking, how do we catalog all genetic variants? How do we systematically associate them with disease? How do we use 
genetic associations to understand disease mechanisms and how do we translate these insights into therapeutics? So how do we systematically understand the basis of disease? Well, it all starts with genetics and genetics actually precedes Darwin and precedes Mendel by thousands of years. Humans have been selectively breeding both animals and plants for thousands of years. If you look at our puppies today, they were you know, much more ready to eat us when they first encountered us before through generations of selectively maintaining the most docile of these wolves, we ended up with the most friendly species on the planet. And it's through generations of selectively breeding, selectively maintaining the most you know, fruitful and delicious uh, plants that we end up with something that's completely inedible to something that's like the workhorse of uh, you know, the food economy uh, in modern days. And it's through selectively uh, you know, mating of the animals with the most wool that we end up with these extremely modified animals today. So that's something that we've understood for thousands of years. Back in ancient Greece, I mean, again, being Greek, I can't uh, help but mention ancient Greece. Anaximander, two and a half thousand years ago, was basically postulating that the first human was born from a non-human relative. And that, in fact, land animals had their origins in the fish. In 300 BC, Aristotle was, in fact, the first to carry out a systematic species taxonomy which is in fact not far off from the taxonomy we have today. And the whole concept of seedlings, of basically planting the seed for the next generation was raised by many philosophers in ancient times. As early as 450 BC, Empedocles suggested that the random mixing of traits would give rise to natural variation and that the successful ones would survive giving the semblance of purpose. This precedes Darwin by, you know, 23 centuries. And <clears throat> in 300 BC, Epicurus basically gave a purely naturalistic generation of diversity without any supernatural intervention. But of course, this was in the context of Plato, the Stoics, religion, Christianity, that were offering a very contrasting picture for many centuries. Getting to Darwin, the contemporaries of Darwin were thinking about transmutation, about this order of complexity and a complexity force pushing animals to become more complex. And there would be some kind of adaptive force and a complexity force moving from, you know, the quote unquote lower organisms to the higher organisms, again, quote unquote. And Lamarck was basically arguing for this innate force, innate life force that would be driving increased complexity. And that's the context in which the genius of Darwin uh, transforms the world. So in 1859, Darwin, for the first time in modern history, argued that there was no such complexity force, that this was just bogus. There was no higher force that was driving evolution in any way that in fact there was a continuum of species and that species were just randomly generating diversity through mutations that were completely random there was no driven mutations to make the giraffe's neck taller that some giraffes were randomly born with taller necks and some giraffes were randomly born with shorter necks and this natural variation would basically be the fodder, the play-doh with which natural selection would then be acting to select the fittest of these organisms. Agape mou debo dume tora, etasi. El oro fez na bisquisina ya, etasi. All right, this is from my auntie. This is Elora. She's turning four years old. When? Tomorrow. Okay. And, that, and tomorrow is my goal. Uh-huh. Leave on Cleo, please. Leave on to Swarakalo. Hello, I got you. Here. 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 Here
Yanni, so I can know what is that yes. Crown your pala, the Laura. Yanni, like it's in a piece, yes, it's a suel, a grigor, a grigor. Like a gentleman. Yes, us. Chris Kalinita. Kalispera, Kalinita. Kalinita, Ligon, Kia, Clis, the Tibor, the Bracalo. Clio, 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 that one, Clis, Lord. <laughs> right, this is a family event. This is uh, the uh, sort of family interlude. So, so Darwin had this immense break, basically saying that there's nothing purposeful about evolution. Mutations are just creating diversity and selection is brutally killing the ones that don't survive. And the, the challenge, of course, is that at the same time, uh, his theory was not quite fully formed. And he knew that. He knew that he had no mechanistic basis for inheritance. He basically was imagining that there would be some kind of combination of traits that would be coming from mom and from dad, giving rise to the next generation. And the problem with that is that you end up with blending inheritance. You don't actually have the ability to separate out um, you know, the selection. Basically, every single generation would be simply an average of the previous two. Uh, and he also had this concept of gemules that would basically be coming from the full set of the body and then together giving information to the egg that would then give information to the developing embryo. And, you know, we keep contrasting Lamarckism of the taller giraffe neck with uh, Darwin. But in fact, this kind of gemule idea, which Darwin incorrectly had, would in fact allow Lamarckism. It would allow sort of taller necks to sort of spread to the egg and eventually give rise to the embryo. So the, the theory of Darwin was missing one component, which was ironically published almost contemporaneously. And Mendel actually sent a letter explaining his theory to Darwin. And that letter was found unopened on Darwin's desk 50 years later. And Mendel's theory of genetics didn't actually pollinate, <laughs> pun intended, um, the scientific community for another 50 years after his death. And with Darwin's incredible mind, being able to connect that with the e extraordinary experimental results that Mendel had, we would have probably saved ourselves 50 years of progress, uh, or, you know, of, of waiting for progress to happen in, in human genetics. So. We basically have on one hand, the incredible advance of Darwin realizing that it's really random mutation and natural selection. And almost in parallel, contemporaneously, Gregor Mendel in his abbey in um, this uh, city of Brno in, uh, uh, you know, very close to Prague and Vienna nowadays, uh, was basically talking about this concept of particulate inheritance this discrete inheritance, that there is in fact no blending, that you're either getting a full B or a full lowercase b. And it was one or the other, and it's discrete. There's no, there's no continuum in any one locus. So M Mendel basically recognized the discrete units of inheritance as genes and the concept of dominance and recessivity. The fact that it doesn't matter how many generations of brown eyes your parents have, you can still have a child with blue eyes because blue is actually recessive. And if you have two recessive ones descending through dozens of generations, you will have fully blue. There's no blending. It's not like diluted out in any way. And that was the second law. And the third one is this independent assortment law, this whole concept that if you have, uh, you know, big and uh, purple, these two traits are in fact inherited independently. And you have this sort of three to one ratio of any one trait and these, you know, um, very specific products of this ratio with combinations of traits. The third uh, force during this transformative years for you know, uh, Darwin's theory and for um, the, the emergence of genetics is that Mendel himself, <laughs> unfortunately, did not quite really believe that his beautiful experiments in the peas 
formed a rule for genetics that was more general, that was broader, and that was in fact applying to human uh, genetics. Why? Because many people recognized that human traits appear to be very continuous. There's no such thing as black or white. There's no such thing as blonde or brunette. There's no such thing as blue or, or, or brown. Every single person is effectively a continuum along a trait, uh, along a, a you know, multidimensional uh, spectrum. And the concept of biometrics of this continuous phenotypic variation was basically holding people back from adopting Mendel's uh, views. And there were many other uh, theories uh, at the same time with saltationism, the concept that every now and then you have these bursts of evolution, orthogenesis and vitalism, near Lamarckism and theistic evolution were basically sort of forces pushing the scientific community in many directions. So this was in fact a time of turmoil. Uh, you know, Darwin's theory was a major, major dramatic shift, but it was not reconciled with these two competing theories for how uh, genetic traits vary. And this all changed with the turn of the century with Fisher basically, and you know, many others recognizing that continuous phenotypic variation could be explained simply by many Mendelian loci. That in fact, even though you see a uh, you know, continuous distribution of height, for example, all it takes is five loci for height to appear continuous, even though it is made out of very discrete steps uh, at any one of these multiple loci. And concomitant with that, we actually started having a molecular basis for inheritance. In 1902, the concept of chromosomes and DNA as the genetic material started emerging. And in 1953, the structure of DNA was finally solved and it did not escape uh, their notice as Watson and Crick very elegantly wrote that this semi-conservative replication of DNA formed immediately a basis of inheritance. The concept that if you have a in one side, you know that you're going to have T in the other side. If you see A, T, T, A, C, you know that on the other side, you're going to have exactly the complementary basis. And therefore, at every replication, the DNA strands are able to perfectly maintain a complete copy of the genetic material. And therefore, as you divide the DNA by opening up these strands, you basically keep an intact copy of the entire genetic material in every one copy. And this is where uh, Mendel's third law of independent assortment, in fact, has given rise to all of modern genetics. So Mendel postulated that if I had a trait for whether someone is tall or short and a trait for someone who has blue eyes or green eyes, that they would be independently assorted. But in fact, uh, Morgan and his student, Stortevent, who I'm showing here, recognized that as they were making these crosses, they basically saw that the specific combinations of traits were not entirely independent of each other, but in fact, they were deviating from Mendel's laws. And then these deviations could be mapped in a straight line that would allow you to, to, to recognize that there were specific mathematical distances between pairs of traits and their loci. And that these mathematical distances would allow you to create a linear order of how are these traits arranged in the chromosome. And this basically gave rise to the revolution in Mendelian trait mapping by creating a set of markers throughout the human genome and then saying that this particular trait is co-inherited with these two markers much more strongly than with those two markers suggesting that that trait is encoded in the chromosome somewhere in between here. And that was in the 1980s. And here we are today exactly 20 years, almost to the day of the publishing of the first draft of the human genome. 
in 2001. And what that human genome project did was basically say, it doesn't matter what the scientific community thinks, we're gonna sequence the entire human genome, including all these junk DNA of the other 98.5%. And what that gave rise to is the ability to understand the patterns of human inheritance, to recognize that human genetic material is inherited in chunks because of the very small number of recombination events at every generation. And these chunks contain many common variants, which are inherited as a block known as a haplotype block or a linkage disequilibrium block. And this whole linkage concept comes from the fact that traits that were near each other were linked. So linkage equilibrium basically tells you that these uh, genetic variants are not what you would expect in equilibrium, that they're in disequilibrium, that they're in fact co-inherited more often than Mendel would have expected. And by systematically cataloging common genetic variation, we were able to map 6 million common genetic variants that are scattered throughout the genome. And to profile them, we did not need to sequence a new genome each time. All we needed to do is create a microarray that had a bunch of spots that would hybridize to one version or another version with different strengths, enabling you to, in fact, genotype the entire genome for thousands of individuals at very, very low cost. So this is the basis for understanding human disease. This is the basis for delivering on the promise of the human genome. So tomorrow in nature, we have an article that's actually studying the uh, impact of the human genome project over the last 20 years and arguing that it is through that decision to sequence the entire human genome that we have really truly transformed human genetics and the understanding of human disease. The workhorse is the picture that I showed you earlier. This is known as a Manhattan plot because at every location of the genome, you basically have an association between that genomic position and that particular trait. Here I'm showing you the Manhattan plot for body mass index. This is a quantitative measure of obesity. And what you can see here, reigning supreme above all these other skyscrapers is this FTO locus, which was promptly renamed to fat and obesity associated, even though initially it stood for fused toes O. So this fat and obesity associated locus was basically telling us that obesity is not entirely your fault. It's not just, hey, you don't eat healthy enough and you don't exercise enough, that there are genetic variants associated with obesity. And in fact, this is very near and dear to my heart because I actually am homozygous for the risk allele for this FTO locus. That basically means that both mom and dad gave me a bad copy. And uh, in fact, I have a predisposition to obesity. So how do we understand the mechanism of all this? What's really exciting about genetics is that um, even if genes were made out of green cheese, we would still be able to identify their locations. In other words, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is. Genetics basically tells us that there's something in this region that is associated with disease. And this region, this FTO locus here, was completely unexpected. It came out of nowhere. And suddenly people were excited because suddenly we have the opportunity to understand the mechanism of disease, to find new target genes that we didn't know about before, to now develop therapeutics against whatever's acting in this locus and to enable precision medicine and personalized medicine. The challenge, of course, is that when we look within this FTO locus, and just like when we look within 93% of these disease hits across the genome and across thousands of different traits, what we see is that the exons that I showed you on the previous slide are tiny. This is an exon right there. And that's another exon right there. They're tiny. And we have this enormous introns where these genetic variants are all sitting and these enormous intergenic regions where these genetic variants are sitting. 
That basically means that none of these genetic variants, in fact, perturbs the FTO protein. That means that the target gene of these genetic discoveries is simply not known. That also means that the causal variant among these 89 variants that are all co-associated with obesity are simply not known. We don't know which one of those causes the disease. We don't know the cell type of action because you know, this region could be acting in liver and that region could be acting in your brain and that region could be acting in your fat cells and so on and so forth. And we don't know the relevant pathways and we don't know the mechanism. So that's the challenge. The amazing promise is that we now have 120,000 regions that are robustly associated with disease. <laughs> the downside is that we actually don't know how they work. And the beauty and the power of genetics is that it doesn't matter how they work, you can discover them. The, the flip side of that coin is that you simply don't know how they work even after you've discovered them. And that's what my research group does. What we try to do is systematically understand the mechanism underlying these genetic variants. We're basically using disease genetics as the foundation of mechanism and then understanding how these genetic variants perturb the RNA and the regulatory circuitry of every single cell in our body, in both healthy individuals and in disease individuals, in order to systematically integrate these resulting data sets and predict the driver genes, regions, and cell types underlying disease. And through these predictions, we can then go and manipulate the underlying biology. We can make predictions about which genes should be targeted to reverse the disease phenotypes and then go and change them in human cell cultures or in animal models and show indeed that we have the tools for manipulating that circuitry. And then of course, disseminating the results after that. So how do we understand that circuitry? So DNA, the most beautiful and noble molecule of our time is in fact not swimming around naked in our cells. It is wrapped around these structures known as nucleosomes. And every nucleosome has 170 bases of DNA wrapped around it and another spacer of about 50 bases. So we basically have you know, 150 bases around the, the nucleosome and another 50 bases as a linker. That gives us 200 nucleotide chunks, 200 letter chunks of the DNA that are packaged up together. And those little chunks have colors they're not just all the same. And these colors come from post-translational modifications of the proteins that make up nucleosomes that color some of them green, some of them yellow, some of them orange and red. And these colors are associated with different functions. So what my group does is systematically study the epigenome, namely the stuff that's on top of the genome, these epigenomic modifications of DNA to systematically understand the circuitry of every one of those cells. How? Because the cell marks up different regions of the DNA that are useful to that cell type. All of our trillions of cells have the same DNA and yet your brain cells and your lung cells and your liver cells and your uh, eyelids and your skin all have completely different functions. How is that possible? That's possible because your neurons utilize a different subset of the DNA encyclopedia of the human genome than your liver, than your heart, than your muscle. And they remember what parts are useful to them through these epigenomic modifications. So by systematically studying these epigenomic modifications, we can understand how the DNA turns on and off in every single disease condition and in every single cell type in the body and between every single person on the planet. And we can use this systematically to wire up the circuitry of every disease locus. Instead of simply saying, oh, here are some genetic associations with disease, we can say, here are the specific nucleotides that are, that are responsible for that association. And those letters, those nucleotide differences, these single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, sit in regulatory regions known as enhancers that loop around and target their, the promoter regions, which are the proximal regions of every gene. So these enhancers 
are controlled by specific regulators through DNA sequence motifs. Every single time you see AAA, GG, TCA, that means that this protein, NR2F2, likes to bind there. It has an affinity for that particular sequence. And this GATA factor binds this GATA motif, very creatively named, and so on and so forth. So that basically gives us a handle to understanding, number one, the regulators, number two, the control regions that they target, number three, when these control regions turn on and turn off, number four, the target genes controlled by these regions, and of course, number five, the specific nucleotides that disrupt these motifs and that disrupt the binding of these regulators. So in my group, we basically use this systematically to understand how disease circuitry works across 30,000 regions. In a paper we published uh, online in Nature last week, and that's actually appearing tomorrow on the 20th anniversary of the Human Genome Project issue of Nature, we basically have the circuits exactly this way for 30,000 loci that you can actually go and browse for you know, more than a year and a half now. We've put everything online, of course. I want to focus on only one of them, <clears throat> which basically takes us back to the first slide that I showed you about this FTO locus that is associated with obesity. So this FTO locus has 89 common variants that are co-inherited with disease. But through these studies, we found that only one of these variants, this T to C letter change between AAT, AAT, T, and AAC, ATT, disrupts a binding motif for this AT rich interacting domain protein, this arid 5 b protein. So arid 5 b is a repressor that normally binds this AT rich motif in you guys, not me, because I'm homozygous for the C version. And when it binds, it represses these IREX3 and IREX5 target genes. What's really remarkable is that these two target genes are in fact sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away from this nucleotide. So that basically means that they're very, very distant acting. And we discovered those two genes are in fact master regulators of a process known as thermogenesis. Again, from the Greek, thermo means heat, genesis means generation. So generation of heat. So what is generation of heat? Every time you have a big meal, you can choose what to do with the excess calories that you don't use chopping up wood and chasing tigers. That excess calorie can be stored for a rainy day in your white adipocytes, or it can be burned as heat through depolarization of your mitochondrial membrane. The mitochondria are the energy factors of your cells. And by depolarizing that membrane, you're basically letting loose of that gradient that sort of creates energy in ATP and instead burning off the energy as heat. So most individuals on this call are able to thermogenize. When they have too many calories, they just feel hot for a while and they just burn them off as heat. For me and members of my family, unfortunately, we are not able to do that. And instead, we store every last calorie we don't burn by exercise. And understanding the circuitry gives hope of manipulating the circuitry. How? by increasing or decreasing the expression of the upstream regulator, by increasing or decreasing the expression of those downstream genes, and even by using genome editing of human cells from primary adipocytes of risk individuals to flip the single letter from T to C and C to T. And what we found in every one of those cases is that it switched back and forth between lean and obese phenotypes. By editing a single letter out of 3 billion letters, we're able to restore the process of thermogenesis in primary adipocytes from risk individuals. Of course, we didn't edit human beings. We took the cells out of the people, and then we edited the cells in a dish. And what we found is that those cells were unable to generate heat, and suddenly they were fully capable of doing so by editing a single letter. And when we put this in a mouse, when we change one of these downstream target genes that's overexpressed in obesity. When we down-regulate it, we find that normal mice, in fact, lose 
all of their fat stores. Their fat stores are completely depleted. They've burned them off. And when you put them on a high fat diet, normal mice gain weight. These IRX3 dominant negative mice are unable to gain weight. They're simply stuck in a thermogenesis position and they just burn off all the calories they have and all of their fat stores. So that's the hope. The hope is that we can systematically understand these circuits and by understanding these circuits, we can reverse these circuits. And by reversing the circuits, we can effectively provide therapeutic interventions against thousands of pathways in the human genome that allow us to finally overcome the limitations of human disease. It doesn't matter whether you're born with a T or a C location. It doesn't matter what makes you obese. What matters is that we can manipulate the corresponding circuits to reverse these disease phenotypes. So in my group, we've basically applied these methods to countless traits across so many different disease loci to understand how these traits are acting. Where is every trait acting in this complexity of the human epigenome? We basically showed that Alzheimer's does not act in neurons as everybody had expected, but instead it appears to act on immune cells of the brain. And we are able to now manipulate those immune cells, both in our circulating blood and in the brain to understand the specific circuits through which these genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's may be acting. For cardiovascular disease and, co and coronary artery disease and liver disease, we're able to understand the specific circuits through which these genetic variants are targeting neighboring genes and the specific tissues in which they're acting. We're able to bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease by finding these intermediate molecular pathways that are altered and understand how we can intervene to manipulate each of those. We're able to dissect at single cell resolution thousands of organs and brains of individuals post-mortem to understand how genetic variants associated with all of these different diseases are in fact acting at the molecular level. We published a study last year in, uh, in Nature again, showing the first single cell dissection of Alzheimer's disease, showing that in fact, the cells from female individuals were dramatically altered compared to the cells from male individuals or, more, or much more associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. We showed that male individuals are able to protect their neurons in the case of Alzheimer's by myelinating them, whereas by, by coating them with, uh, myelin, with myelination, this lipid coating, whereas female individuals were not able to do that. And we found dramatic differences between male and female individuals in uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. In the case of schizophrenia, we again, in just a few weeks ago, posted online the first single cell dissection of schizophrenia, enabling us to take this Manhattan plot here shown on the side and associate nearly every single peak associated with schizophrenia with a, a specific gene that is dysregulated that is either overexpressed or downregulated, and the specific brain cell types where these are acting. And in contrast to Alzheimer's disease, that appears to be primarily initially acting through microglia, genetic variants associated with, uh, with schizophrenia are primarily acting through excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And in fact, we seem to have discovered a second path to schizophrenia. Rather than global gene expression changes, there's, uh, there appears to be one cell state, SZTR, which is dramatically more abundant in uh, individuals with schizophrenia, even when they don't show the global expression changes associated with disease. We're able to go upstream and find the regulators that control these and show how they act both in early development and in the adult human. We're able to study countless such disorders, understand the spatial organization of the human brain and infer specific subtypes of immune cells, these synaptic immune cells versus these inflammatory immune cells. The synaptic immune cells are pruning neuronal connections and the inflammatory ones are fighting with 
uh, pathogens. And we show how, in fact, different types of microglia are, in fact, associated with um, different types of disorders. So there are countless more stories that uh, I can tell you about our, our work uh, on disease. Uh, I can tell you about how we're using evolution to understand the differences between species and to be able to pinpoint specific regulatory regions associated with disease. And um, we're also using uh, Darwin's um, legacy of evolution to understand this little bugger, which is 29,000 nucleotides of trouble. This is, in one slide, the entire genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic that has us all talking to each other on Zoom as opposed to meeting in person. And we've been able to actually study the patterns of evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 virus compared to all of its relatives to understand what are the specific genes that it encodes. And we were able to actually discover that there are locations that people previously thought were genes that are in fact not genes at all. They don't encode proteins. And we were able to discover another location that in fact encodes a protein that was previously overlooked that is in fact encoded in an alternate reading frame of an existing protein. We were able to study using comparative genomics the speed with which amino acids are changing between different strains of virus and within the current pandemic and study acceleration and deceleration compared to what you would expect. And we're able to also study the mutation that you guys are all reading about in the news that are making the virus more transmissible or less transmissible and understand their evolutionary context. One of these mutations, the spike D614G mutation, that in fact changes a D into a G in position 614 of the spike protein, is in fact perturbing a nucleotide that has never been altered in the history of these coronaviruses in a region of 11 amino acids that are perfectly conserved across all these species, suggesting that it might be a human-specific adaptation of this virus to a new human host. So I will stop there because my goal is to really speak with you guys and ask questions. But I'll say that um, you know this is work that would not be possible without amazing, amazing collaborators. We run a very interdisciplinary team here at MIT with biologists and computer scientists and medical doctors and psychiatrists and you know dietitians and you know uh, just an extremely diverse team. And uh, many of the alumni for the, from the group have now started their own labs. So we're looking for new students and postdocs. So uh, we're looking for both computational and experimental people. So if you're motivated, uh, please come join us. And uh, that's where I will stop because I see 27 questions in the chat. Uh, all right. So Mark, I don't know how you want to do this. Well, first, thank you, Dr. Kellis, for an amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you. Some of us will clap virtually with our virtual hands like this. Um, I, I, so yes, there are uh, numerous questions. People are chomping at the bit to talk with you. Um, Dr. Kellis, thank you uh, on behalf of the School of Natural and Social Sciences, uh, biology department, and all, all of us um, for that really stimulating talk. And I look forward to the questions which you and Mark, I think will be able to handle. I'd also like to thank Amanda Zalo, the office manager for the School of Natural and Social Sciences for having done just uh, as she always does an incredible amount of work to put this um, event together, uh, both kind of administratively and technically, logistically as the kind of host of our Zoom tonight. So thank you, Amanda, as well. All right, so we're gonna be a little, uh... Unusual here, instead of everybody typing in their questions, you guys can just raise your hand, either virtually or in person, uh, wave it, and then I'll be happy to uh, take questions. So Gabrielle, I see that you have the first question. Hi, um, I'm now getting into bio like this year. Um, and I was wondering, like, since you do computational biology, which uh, coding programs do you think are the most essential for your field or like the ones that you find yourself using the most? It's, uh, it, it has varied through the years, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been hooked on Python and I feel that the whole community is getting hooked on Python. So if you're gonna choose one language, 
Python is a great way to start. And a lot of the deep learning community has in fact now moved onto Python because there's so many libraries that you can use. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful language, really fun. So try it out. Thank you. Again, I'm happy to answer questions across the whole gamut uh, of uh, disease to computer science. So fire away. And we'll be monitoring the chat. So if you do want to type your question in the chat, feel free to do that. And uh, we can do it that way too. But un unmute your microphone if you have a question. Diego, you had your hand up as well. Hi, thank you for the lecture. It's extremely, extremely interesting. Um, I have two questions actually. Uh, one of them is, can how do you deliver this uh, modifications um, to, for example, when we're we're talking about the region, the binding region for the regulatory of the FDO locus? Is it deliverable in somatic cells, or do you have to deliver in German cells? And the other question is: Is it common to find regulatory regions controlling more than one locus? Let's say it's re it's regulating I don't know FTO and something else, and if so. Well, altering the regulation of one single regulatory region decrease the expression or just flat out eliminate the expression of the whole thing? These are both outstanding questions. Thank you so much, Diego. So really, really fabulous question. So um, the, the first question is uh, about the uh, delivery of therapeutics. Uh, I want to caution everyone into sort of realizing that the path between understanding the mechanism and having a therapeutic is very large. It can take many years, sometimes multiple decades. So the, you know, um, you know, what needs to happen? What you need to do is figure out, number one, how to actually target those proteins, how to, you know, manipulate them. And the traditional approach for that has been medicinal chemistry. That basically means you're running an entire library of small molecules against all of your um, you know, targets. And then you're seeing which molecules bind the target and which molecules sort of change the structure of the target in just the right way to deactivate its function and so on and so forth. That is being dramatically transformed now with machine learning. We're able to use graph neural networks to understand how to design new protein, and sorry, new small molecules that can fit into those proteins and sort of you know, manipulate their structure. Uh, and um, that, you know, that has now the advantage of sort of speeding up the search for these, uh, you know, molecular changes. Um, number two, beyond just attacking the protein level, we can actually think about sort of manipulating the regulatory circuitry. We can think about manipulating the, um, you know, the upstream regulators and so on and so forth. So there are other ways of intervening beyond just the protein level. For example, antisense RNA can repress the expression of a particular gene or delivering an mRNA, just like Moderna and you know, BioNTech are now doing for COVID-19, delivering an mRNA to your cells can basically leave your cells to generate a protein out of that mRNA and then to translate it and you know, sort of change the function of those cells in that way. So there are many, many different ways of delivering beyond just the traditional medicinal chemistry approach, but those are very lengthy. Uh, as for editing the human genome, uh, you know, there's enormous uh, ethical uh, barriers to doing so. And for something like obesity, my guess is that it will never be done because we know of non-pharmaceutical interventions like, you know, eat healthy, exercise more. Um, but for diseases that are, that are truly debilitating and, you know, uh, sort of have an enormous impact, uh, we saw in the news just three weeks ago from actually the, the son of my next door neighbor, uh, Luke Koblan, was in fact the first author of that paper. And my very good friend, David Liu, was a senior author uh, here at the Broad Institute. And they basically showed that editing that one nucleotide associated with progeria in mice was able to actually cure progeria in mice. And, and sort of that's, that's an application where it wouldn't even be um, a question as to whether we should do that or not if we can deliver it safely within humans. Uh, so for some, for some conditions, uh, intervention, you know, sort of rises to that level. Your second question was about uh, the, uh, the, the targeting of multiple target genes from a single uh, locus. And the example that I showed you of FTO is in fact one such example. 
You basically have IREX3 and IREX5, which are both targeted by the same regulatory region. And that's a situation where the two genes appear to be actually having synergistic effects. And you know, either one alone was in fact recapitulating a phenotype, which is quite, quite remarkable. And what we're seeing across the genome is that for many of these top scoring loci that are associated with disease, that sort of the strongest association with disease, you have multiple SNPs working in concert, and in some cases, multiple target genes working in concert, and in some cases, multiple tissues working in concert. So that, to me, basically says that um, pleiotropy, which basically means, again, from Greek, plio means many, and then tropos means ways, many ways, so things that act in many ways, is going to be more of the rule rather than the exception in understanding these disease loci. And the way that I think about this is that there's an, there's an enormous ascertainment bias where basically we're looking for the loci that are associated with disease and therefore we're selecting the places where these multiple random changes have all aligned and pushed in the same direction. And, and sort of that's why we're ending up finding all of these uh, pyotropies. I see Julia Diamond has her hand up. So Julia. Um, thanks for your really interesting talk. Um, my question is more big picture and involving ethics um, than actual science and um, <laughs> your talk. Um, just a personal question for you. Did you have reservations about seeing your own genome, um, if you're willing to talk about that? And um, does your field or team anticipate any pushback in terms of individuals maybe not necessarily wanting to know their own genomes, um, presumably in between the time when we can see what's going on in the genes, but before maybe personalized therapeutics are available to do something about it? It's a very deep and profound uh, sort of ethical question, and I, I don't claim to have the answer. Uh, in fact, these are ethical questions that the whole field is still struggling with. I'm absolutely in favor of, you know, I don't want to know, end of story. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, for me to release my genome online also means that my, my children suddenly have their genome online. So when I talk about my own predispositions, uh, you know, I'm sort of revealing information about my own children and my relatives, which, you know, they might not want to have out there. So, you know, it's, it's also because of the relatedness of human, it's a question that you should not be able to make a loan without consulting with your family members about what information you'd like to, to reveal. Um, that said, I want to uh, sort of push a little back uh, against genetic exceptionalism. Basically, uh, many people think that the genome is so, so special and has so, so many secrets that we should not reveal. Uh, but I, I, I want to basically tell you that if you're comfortable sharing your uh, Google search history, uh, your email, your uh, Facebook posts and you know Facebook kits and your uh, browsing history and so on and so forth, um, these are much more informative about your health status and even of your future health than your genome is. So we need better privacy protection for not just genomics, but for all of these sort of social uh, data from either social websites or from, you know, uh, all of these free uh, websites where, uh, you know, they say if something is free, you are the product. Uh, so, you know, when you're using Gmail and when you're using all of these uh, sites, you're sort of uh, letting go a lot of your uh, privacy. So that's something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize. And, um, you know, it poses, it poses important ethical concerns. I feel that the protections that we should have for human health should be much larger than what we have now. We have to protect everyone, not just the people who happen to have the right assortment of uh, genetic predispositions to disease. Um, and for that, I think universal healthcare is the right answer. And that's something that we should provide for all. And I think it will decrease uh, healthcare costs dramatically, uh, and it will sort of decrease this extortion from insurance companies uh, that is happening daily, in you know throughout throughout our society. So, um, but but again, these are enormously complex ethical questions, and I hope that 
you know, we, we move to a society that's much more fair and much more uh, protective of its members than what we have now. All right, I see Sonia, Seth, with her hand up. Um, thank you for your talk, that was really interesting. My question is, have you or your team looked into the relationship between the gut microbiome and diseases like obesity and Alzheimer's, given that um, like my microbial communities have such a vast genome, perhaps more vast than the human genome? Yeah, so, so uh, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, just like the epigenome captures a lot of information about your environment and is associated with disease and you know, your genetics and it modulates your genetics, one of the strongest uh, influences on, on your genetics <laughs> and then sort of how your genetics will impact your phenotype is in fact your microbiome. So we carry uh, on us more bacterial cells than human cells. Uh, and those bacterial cells primarily inhabit our gut and they are transforming all of the food that we have into nutrients. They help break down those nutrients. And through, through this process, they basically decide what kind of metabolism we have and what nutrients we take from the environment. And those nutrients are basically what then interface our entire body. So the obesity and Alzheimer's have been both associated with the gut microbiome enormously. And the association with obesity is very, very uh, you know, obvious in many ways because this is what digests your food in many ways. So, uh, but, but for Alzheimer's, it's a little more counterintuitive. And uh, for many, many other disorders, the microbiome has been shown to have a strong, uh, strong effect. So uh, this is not something that we are doing systematically in my team, but this is absolutely a variable that's enormously important in the field and something that you know, should not be uh, ignored. So thank you, thank you for bringing that up. I see Nicole Parkinson. Uh, yes, um, good afternoon. And uh, definitely thank you for the um, very interesting lecture. I actually, I have two questions that I wanted to piggyback off. Um, Julia, I believe it was, and then Diego. Um, I guess the first one would be the ethics question. Um, Cause I've actually thought about getting my genome sequence but it's something that I'm very apprehensive about doing because I'm scared that, you know, there it is potential there for um, that information to be abused. Uh, for example, like if the insurance companies decide they want to base um, who they enroll on their predisposition, predispositions to certain diseases, um, that's a fear that I have that it could be abused in that way. Then the... Um, Oh, uh, so I guess my question would be, uh, uh, what do you think the chances of that happening is? And then my other question, I wanted to ask you um, about your research, um, was that if you were planning on bringing it to clinical trials, but based off your responses to um, Diego's question, I'm assuming that you're not. So I was wondering where do you um, intend to next bring your research? Thank you so much for both questions. So the first one is, um, what, so, so it's a loaded question basically whether you should sequence your genome and whether you should let insurance companies have access to your genome and whether insurance companies should have the right to discriminate based on your genome. So these are three separate questions. Um, the first one is uh, in my view, uh, information that is helpful. It's not for everyone, but knowing your genetic predispositions for yourself with the appropriate privacy uh, constraints and the appropriate genetic counseling um, can help you plan accordingly. Knowing that I have a predisposition for AMD, which is a late onset disease, I can you know, eat my vegetables, I can do my exercise, I can sort of wear sunglasses when I'm in the sun, I can sort of take preventative measures that will ensure that my behavior and the way that the environment impacts the disease will basically minimize the chances of the disease actually manifesting. So in contrast to your search history and your email, et cetera, the advantage of the genome is that it, it has predictive value, especially for late onset disorders. So in that sense, with the appropriate uh, warning signs and uh, sort of appropriate counseling from your doctor or from specific genetic counselor, it is worth 
uh, you know, uh, possibly exploring that information to take appropriate actions that can be preventative. Um, as for diseases where there is no treatment and there is no prevention, I think many of the genetic companies are basically giving you the option to reveal that information or not after you, you've had your genome. It basically says, hey, do you really want to know because this is not curable and, and so and so forth. So uh, you can sort of take the decision to genotype most of your genetic variants and obtain the answer for most of them, namely the actionable ones, uh, and then not read, not reveal that information for the non-actionable ones. The second question is whether the insurance companies uh, should be having access to that information. And the answer is absolutely not. You should not reveal to them uh, you know, anything that you don't want to disclose. The challenge, of course, becomes if they say, oh, great, of course, we don't ask you to reveal your genome, but we're going to give you a discount if you show us your genome. <laughs> so, um, you know, then effectively, it's like jacking up the price of everyone and then, you know, reducing the price for the ones that actually show their genome. Um, so there needs to be legislation against that. We have some existing protections. There's a Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that was signed, you know, maybe a decade ago that uh, takes some steps towards that, but it's not uh, adequate and it's not sufficient. And we need many more uh, steps against that. Um, and the third one is, should insurance companies be allowed to discriminate against the genetic uh, variant? Uh, I mean, absolutely not. Uh, I feel that universal coverage is really the answer to solving all of these ethical questions. If we know that everyone will be covered, then of course we need the genetics early on so that we can appropriately intervene to really keep everybody healthy. Because the decision then is not whether we need someone to be healthy or not, whether we need to drop them off coverage. The decision is how do we as a society make sure that everyone stays healthy the longer the, the you know possible? And how do we intervene early for everyone with a predisposition? Because effectively, from a purely utilitarian you know, approach, that's what's going to cost all of our society the least by sort of helping people before the disease becomes more severe. So the, the ability to sort of use genetic information to intervene early is something that would be a benefit to the society if we had a society that actually cared about every person. Unfortunately, you know, in the US right now, this is not the case. We can choose whether we enroll somebody in insurance or not. And I think that's a horrible uh, decision, which basically pushes many people to, to not want to know. And I think if the decision was, we're going to take care of everyone, tell us what your future or current ailments are, then I think the equation changes dramatically towards more knowledge is always better. All right, Chia Ling Song, you have your uh, hand up and a beautiful cat as your picture. Hi, sorry. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it because I was a little late to the, the lecture, but um, you mentioned uh, the intervene. Uh, intervention or intervening with the cir circus circuits um but when you do that would there be any risk of like side effects or you know what i'm saying like um yeah that's an that's an excellent question and uh thank you so much for bringing it up up until now all of the ethical questions that i've answered have been with the assumption that we will do more good than harm uh of course this is uh, most of the time, not the case. And that's why clinical trials go through multiple phases. And the first phase is safety. And the second phase is efficacy. So knowing that something doesn't do harm, it comes before knowing that something actually helps. And the side effects are, you know, uh, what has very often uh, killed uh, many drugs. Uh, and then, you know, um, the... The advantage of having the complete genome, of having the complete circuitry, is that we can computationally predict some of those side effects. The, the advantage of having these cellular models, the advantage of having animal models, is that we can sort of, again, predict many of these side effects before they manifest in uh, human clinical trials. So that's something that's absolutely a first step. Uh, but of course, there are, uh, you know, many unforeseen same things. And that's, and that's why drug development takes so long. And that's why, um, you know, so many drugs fail, unfortunately, 
but my 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 feeling and my hope is that with increasing knowledge comes increasing predictive power both in maximizing the on target effects but also in minimizing the off target effects and by understanding the surgery we can basically say here's where we should be intervening and perhaps multiple weak interventions might be a better outcome than one strong intervention which might have strong side effects but by sort of triangulating and having multiple weak perturbations uh, of the same pathway we might be able to sort of mitigate some of those side effects again all of this is still in flux and that's a field that's sort of growing and changing but um i i, I do feel that better you know more more knowledge deeper knowledge is, is really the answer here uh, Tsunagu Ichikawa, you are, uh, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I was pretty interested in your mention of the, I guess, like the immune interactions of Alzheimer's disease. And I did a little bit of archival research in a previous class that I took, and I do remember coming across an antimicrobial hypothesis, I believe it was called. Um, and I was wondering if that's what you were referencing when you mentioned that, and if that were the case, I could imagine that gene-related therapies would go in a completely different direction, and you know perhaps become pretty convoluted. I just wanted to hear a little bit more of an elaboration on that. If that's okay, and if that's appropriate for uh, this time. So uh, I'm gonna thank you so much for your question. It's an outstanding question, and uh, it's it's a fascinating topic. To uh, to clarify, the antimicrobial hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease is that amyloid beta which causes these plaques in, you know, between our cells, and perhaps even tau, which causes the neurofibrillary tangles inside our cells, are an ancient immune response of our brain. So as we know, the brain has an immense amount of vasculature of sort of, you know, blood irrigation, because it actually consumes, despite weighing only three pounds, it consumes 20% of the energy, uh, you know, of, of our body. So our brain is enormously more capable than any other species, enormously more dense, enormously more energy efficient, but also despite all of that energy efficiency, enormously more energy consuming. So despite having all these amounts of irrigation, the brain is immensely protected from the circulating blood through a blood brain barrier. So that's a set of uh, cells that are endothelial cells, pericytes, uh, mural cells, and fibroblasts and other cells that are basically creating a barrier between the circulating blood and the brain. So the brain basically gets all of the nutrients, but none of the <clears throat> pathogens. However, uh, some pathogens are able to still enter the brain by first infecting, for example, a neuron that has its soma in the rest of the body and its axons inside the, the brain and vice versa. So they can travel either presynaptically or postsynaptically and effectually, effect, eventually infiltrate the brain. And that can happen for viruses. There are many viruses such as rabies, for example, that can travel through the synaptic connections. And can basically cause harm in the brain despite these levels of protection. So the antimicrobial hypothesis of Alzheimer's is that amyloid beta is in fact trapping pathogens, that it's trapping viruses and it's trapping bacteria and serving as a last line of defense for the brain in order to protect the brain. And you, know, you can see how in the history of human, um, uh, the human race, and sort of our pre-human uh, you know, uh, relatives, you would have brain injuries with where it's actually very beneficial to have that additional line of defense. And because everybody dies young anyway, you never live long enough to see the detrimental effects of amyloid beta, which ultimately ends up harming the cells when you live to your 70s and 80s and 90s and 100s, which we do now. So, this is, you know, this is one hypothesis and it's called the microbial hypothesis or the anti, the, 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 the pathogenic response um, uh, hypothesis of Alzheimer's. Um, as a public service announcement, I want to tell all the young people uh, on, on this call are basically saying, yay, I don't care about COVID. Look, it doesn't kill me. Uh, that maybe it, uh, it will sort of lead to this immune response in your brain that will create an abundance of amyloid 
which 30 years and 40 years down the road might actually cause you to have an increased chance for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, after the 1918 flu pandemic, for many decades, there was a dramatic uh, increase in the prevalence of Parkinson's disease. And many people think that this was in fact associated with the amyloid buildup in order to combat the flu back in 1918. That said, immune processes in your brain can have many, many associated consequences. So basically the microglia help clean up your brain. They sort of help clean up the amyloid plaques. They help uh, prune synaptic connections that are not getting utilized. They are both beneficial and detrimental. They're beneficial because they're sort of, you know, helping maintain homeostasis of your brain, but they can also be detrimental if they become either inactive or too active and so on and so forth. So our, our in, in immune enrichment uh, that we saw in Alzheimer's disease basically means that the genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease lie within gene regulatory regions of microglia, of the immune cells of the brain, rather than lie within regulatory regions of neurons. They're actually depleted for regulatory regions of neurons. So what that basically tells us is that the genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's is associated with microglial enhancers, microglial gene regulatory control regions. That could be overactivating them, that could be underactivating them, that could be fighting pathogens, that could be independent of the pathogen hypothesis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a much broader set of possibilities than the specific you know, uh, pathogen hypothesis. Uh, but I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'd probably go look for that after this. So thank you so much. All right. So I see never... Walters. Oh, no, I see Nicoli Parkinson. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, there's one, one question in the chat um, uh, that came up earlier. Uh, what inspired your curiosity in this field besides your father? That's very sweet. Um, so my father is not a scientist. My mother is not a scientist either. The, you know, my father's an engineer. He's a civil engineer. He built houses for, uh, you know, for, for his profession. And my mother is an architect. So she designed houses. <laughs> so uh, my, my uncle uh, is a scientist who has inspired many, many. But I have to say that my passion for biology preceded me understanding anything of what my uncle was doing because I was living in Greece and my uncle was living in uh, New York. Um, so I didn't actually get to experience the joy of science uh, firsthand with my uncle. Uh, my brother, as an adult, uh, you know, after his undergrad, uh, spent a summer with my aunt Elise and my uncle Michael in Hawaii, collecting flies in the rainforest of Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he certainly uh, was immensely inspired uh, by that experience, but he ended up not becoming a scientist. As for me, uh, I became an engineer first before I became a scientist. So I basically went to computer science because I loved math and I loved sort of the sciences and I loved sort of programming and, you know, building things with computers. And my first uh, paper, paper was in computational geometry. So it was basically looking at three-dimensional surface reconstruction and sort of, you know, delonic tetrahedralizations of clouds of points to, to sort of infer surfaces from these clouds. My second paper was about human vision and sort of how to recognize images and structures within these images. My third project was about uh, robots and decentralized control. And fourth project was about human motion analysis and multi-body uh, movements, et cetera. So it wasn't until uh, the end of undergrad that I finally uh, got into uh, biology and it was through uh, evolution. It was very much through Darwin. I, uh, you know, it's funny because I published this paper uh, in Nature last week and on Facebook, my sister basically says, Manolis, I remember when we were undergrad, you would tell me that you have this hypothesis that all of this junk DNA is actually super useful and there's no way that the genes is all of the story and you were going to figure it out. And I had, of course, forgotten all about this, but <laughs> I wrote a paper uh, for one of my classes at MIT as an undergrad that basically was, um, uh, you know, had the provocative title of uh, evolution with a purpose. 
<laughs> uh, exactly contrary to the introduction that I just gave. And it was meant to, to be provocative, but it was basically claiming that within the non-coding regions, uh, our genome is sort of, you know, learning how to evolve better. That in fact, in order to have evolution accelerate the same, the, the, the way that we've seen it with sort of, you know, very simple organisms taking billions of years to form and eventually this incredible acceleration of the 11th hour of evolution with what we see now, that basically the only plausible way uh, being a computer scientist and thinking about genetic algorithms and how long they would take to explore this space was that meta evolution would exist and sort of evolution would get better at evolving before getting better at particular functions and that sort of encoded within our non coding uh, uh, DNA would be in fact mechanisms for uh, reverting to, uh, uh, you know, previous functions. So sort of this sort of switch of going back and forth uh, between evolution and, and so forth. Anyway, so to write that theory, I basically went off and read a bunch of uh, chapters from my, my uh, friend Christina Carvey uh, and uh, her, her, uh, her biology book, because she was a biology major, I was a computer science major. So here I am in Toscanini uh, at the uh, you know, uh, student center of MIT, um, which is now Anastasia, reading the genetics book. Uh, and I see my friend Serafim Batsoglu, who's, uh, who then became a professor at Stanford, who he was a few years my senior, reading the same book. And this is where I want to make another public service announcement. Um, I knew Serafim through Greek dancing, so Greek folk dancing. There's a picture on the MIT Tech where, you know, I'm sort of standing on Serafim's shoulder doing figures of Greek dancing. And if it wasn't for my extracurricular activities, I would have met, never met Tammy Yap who basically uh, told me about the MIT 6A program and allowed me to apply for this internship that then led to my first paper publication. I wouldn't have known Serafim Batsoglu, thanks to whom I eventually got into genomics. So public service announcement is uh, have a life, uh, <laughs> meet people, make friends, uh, start random conversations because you don't know which of these paths will in fact lead you to, uh, you know, sort of life shifting decisions. So I basically saw that Serafin was reading the same genetics book that I was reading. And I'm like, you're a computer scientist. Why are you reading the book I was reading last night? He's like, well, you are a computer scientist. Why are you reading the book I'm reading right now? And he basically took me to Eric Lander's uh, office where uh, mm -hmm. Serafin was basically writing the first algorithms for assembling the human genome. And uh, Eric Lander, as you know, is now the science advisor for uh, Biden. Uh, which makes me very hopeful about science returning to the front lines uh, in the US. But Eric Lander was basically one of the many heads of the Human Genome Project. And uh, so Serafin was working with Eric Lander and Bonnie Berger, and Serafin basically showed me his pages and pages of code for assembling the human genome. And, uh, you know, I was a brat, I was a young kid, I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm not impressed with your code, where's the data? And he showed me the data and he opened up a text file basically had the first assembly of the human genome. And I just finished writing this silly paper about sort of, you know, this theory of how evolution should work, etc. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to theorize about all that stuff. I can actually get my hands on data. And that was transformative, seeing a text file of ACGT, basically the first slide that I showed you <laughs> is what transformed me from a computer scientist into, uh, sorry, a computer scientist who's studying a different problem. So, uh, and I do wanna make that point, the fact that what I realized in front of my eyes was that biology was suddenly computer science, that it was about understanding a code. I had in front of me an inscrutable puzzle of three billion letters that make the most amazing machine that has ever been you know, evolved or, or designed for that matter. So, uh, the joy of using computer science and using sort of these tools for AI, now machine learning, algorithm statistics, and sort of computational thinking and computational data mining on this incredible piece of code that was written well before any human piece of code was exhilarating. And that's sort of what made my transformation. And it's only a few years later when I started doing comparative genomics, first in yeast, then in mammals, and then in flies, that uh, everybody started saying, wait a minute, 
aren't you Michael's nephew? <laughs> so I, I started getting involved in these 12 flies comparative genomics project. And then I learned that my uncle was a fly geneticist with my aunt Elise. And uh, the, you know, I met Bill Gilbart and all of, you know, Peter Cherbas and all of his uh, friends and, and, and sort of buddies, Peter Sartavani, Sakonov. So this incredible fly community was like so fond of my uncle and they embraced me as their adopted child. And uh, that was an incredible moment uh, in my career. But uh, the story for how I got into fly genetics is even more interesting. Bill Gilbert uh, has a former student who invites me to a talk in Greece. I accept, but then circumstances are that I cannot make it. So I tell Bill Gilbert, can you please give my talk? Here are the slides, I can walk you through it. And he says, Manolis, I will give your talk under one condition. You will then turn and apply all of these methods that you've developed for mammals and, and yeast to flies. <laughs> and little did I know what I was getting myself into. But anyway, we, uh, we then uh, were suddenly involved in the fly modern code project and the fly comparative genomics project and so on and so forth. So anyway, it's a, it's a long convoluted story. But since you've now met all of my three kids, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate to talk about my uncle, my father, and my auntie, who's amazing and is here in this podcast, in this, in this uh, conversation. Oh, I have to. Um, oh, oh, Elise is raising her hand. Uh, no, Manoli, no. thank you very, very much for sharing this very exciting field with everybody. Um, it, I'm sure it's quite inspiring for all the young people here. And uh, I'm, um, I have to say, I'm very happy that in your journeys, you actually found biology and not only <laughs> flies, but uh, all the wonderful uh, problems that you're working on now. Um, I'm getting pretty archaic now, but uh, being from the, the pre-genomic era um, and uh, in the early days, of course, we didn't even know how to sequence DNA. And then we learned how to do it very, very laboriously, taking a whole year to sequence a very short stretch of DNA. So it was a lot of work and it's just mind boggling to see how the field has developed and, and particularly the progress in genomics over the last uh, 20 plus years. And so I'm going to be very excited to read your paper in Nature, uh, which I'm sure will review um, all of the highlights. Uh, it's a long, rich story, and um, you've done a wonderful job sharing some of it tonight. Uh, there's so many more details that uh, you don't have time to discuss, but you know maybe we can discuss you know later on. But just one quick question. Uh, coming back to the regulatory regions, I'm wondering in all of your searches, if you can estimate a proportion of where there are disease associated variants in the enhancers versus the introns. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, is it primarily in enhancers or is there a significant proportion of disease associated variants in the introns? Thank you so much, Elise, for the wonderful question. And thank you again for being part of the uh, invitation committee here. It's, uh, you know, you were certainly a big part in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, the enthusiastic yes that I said within many seconds of receiving the invitation. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I want to uh, sort of, you know, building your question to, to sort of say that I painted a very partial picture of you know, gene regulatory regions that are bound by transcription factors that are then controlling genes far away and so on and so forth. This is just the first knob of gene regulation, the pre-transcriptional enhancer knob. Once the regulators are binding the enhancer, they then turn around and loop to the promoter. And there's additional regulatory knobs about pausing of polymerase before it elongates and making that decision to elongate. After that decision to elongate, there are additional regulatory norms about splicing, deciding whether to maintain particular introns or exons, and the sort of final protein is a product of these additional decisions. After the mature mRNA is produced, there are additional regulatory knobs about degrading that mRNA or maintaining its lifetime or stabilizing it, and there are modifications of the RNA itself, epitranscriptomics, so just like epigenomics on top of the 
genome, epitranscriptomics is on top of the transcriptome, such as M6A methylation of um, you know, the uh, A's uh, of, of uh, the RNA. Um, there's also microRNA target sites that basically can lead to the degradation of the RNA, the inhibition of its translation and so on and so forth. And then uh, after all of these regulatory knobs, there are post-translational modifications that are driven by the specific amino acid residues that can themselves be subject to mutations that inhibit particular um, modifications there. There's export control of the mRNA itself and the localization of this mRNA on the mitochondrial membrane, on the soma, on you know, sort of particular organelles. There's localization of the proteins themselves by having you know, uh, translational, so post-translational signals that are sort of guiding the proteins to be exported in particular locations and so on and so forth. And uh, there's degradation of the proteins themselves and so on and so forth. And genetic mutations can act at any one of these knobs. Now, enhancers can localize within introns or in the intergenic regions. They can also localize within the protein coding regions. Uh, and we have found examples, for example, in the Hox clusters that have been immensely uh, important in development and in Drosophila in humans and so, so forth. Um, within the protein coding Hox genes, we had a paper 13 years ago that basically showed that regulatory motifs lie within the Hox clusters encoded within the protein coding uh, sequence. So enhancers can be found in the three prime UTR, downstream of the gene, looping around uh, within the gene and so on and so forth. Uh, now, to answer your question uh, more directly, which I'm sure is getting at the role of potentially splicing variants or variants acting on the RNA that are transcribed along with the protein. Um, there have been various papers estimating the impact of splicing variants on gene regulation, and they estimate it to be about 40%. If you look at our paper uh, that, that we're publishing in, in uh, tomorrow, basically, uh, that, that appeared last week online, uh, we basically can quote unquote explain about half of the genetic associations that we are uh, studying. So there's 120,000 associations. Of these, about 60,000 are associated with the traits that we chose to focus on, which are the most well-powered traits. And out of those 60,000, 30,000 lie within enhancers that are in enriched tissues. So. That is more or less consistent. So about half of it is pre-transcriptional according to our methods and about 40% is splicing per se and probably the remaining 10% are additional sort of regulatory knobs in the whole pathway that I was describing. Again, this is only focusing on common variants. There's a whole other aspect of the allele frequency spectrum that is associated with rare variants. And you know these are, um, uh, primarily falling in protein coding genes and probably promoters as well. So the stronger effect versus the weaker effect variants. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that answers your question. Again, I don't want to sort of uh, overstate the confidence of these numbers. These are all estimates. These, these are still early days, but this would be my best guess if I had to guess. But my first answer is, frankly, we still don't know. Well, thank, thank you, Manoli. Um, there's many, many layers of complexity in gene regulation, and you uh, did a very quick uh, summary. Um, a lot of good cell biology for the students thank you, this is class. to uh, refresh their, their knowledge. Thank you. And um, I, I can see that, um, I mean, you've come a long, long way, but uh, there's still many, many questions still to be addressed. And it doesn't look like you're going to run out of work anytime soon. So good luck with the quest. Thank you so much, Elise. Thank you. So are there any publicly available machine learning models and or public data sets available that would allow students to start working with the science that you described, asks John Walter. So it's a, John Walters. So it's excuse, a, me, excuse me, I, 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 this is so fascinating. And it's, and it's obviously like there's an endless fount of, uh, of conversations we could have. I think this probably would be best to make it the last question if, and uh, to kind of, to be so that we can wrap up. You've been very generous with your time and allow you to go spend some more time with your family and, and the rest of us to go to. I do not mean to cut us off abruptly. This has been so enjoyable and I'm 
thoroughly enjoying the, everything you're happy to say. Thank you, Rudy. You're giving me an out because frankly, I wouldn't mind staying here all night, but I can hear the kids, you know, crying up there. So <laughs> I'll be heading up soon. So uh, it's, it's a great question to end on. Are there publicly available machine learning models and public data sets available that would allow students to start working with the science that you described? So the first thing I would say is that I've been recording all of my uh, MIT lectures and posting them on the web for free. So if you just uh, go on YouTube, you will be able to sort of find all of my lectures uh, for many years now. And uh, I, I really do believe in the democratization of knowledge. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching another class in a few days and that will also be online for free. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, you know, well outside my own courses and well outside MIT, there's enormous resources online for really getting started in this material. My course focuses more on the algorithms and the machine learning uh, be behind all of these tools. Other courses focus more on using the tools and sort of how to use public software uh, for you know making these um, you know particular uh, analyses that uh, my group has been you know working more on the method development other people are working more on the tool building and um, and, and both of them are extremely extremely important um, so um, in terms of data sets every single data set that we've ever worked on uh, has been publicly available this is something that, uh, you know, for example, for the EpiMap paper that, that is appearing in, pr in print, uh, you know, this week, um, the data was made available a year and a half ago before we even submitted the paper. So the first thing we did is that we built a website, we put all the data up there, and then we started analyzing it for, uh, you know, writing a paper that will eventually appear, you know, multiple years down the road. And this is very often the case. Many of these uh, enormous projects that I've been part of ENCODE, Roadmap Epigenomics, GTEx, 29 Mammals, Mod ENCODE, uh, you know, 12 Flies, uh, EGTEx, all of these projects as a mandate make the data immediately publicly available as soon as it's generated and, you know, quality control. So uh, we continue to do that in my lab and many others will continue to do that. So you will find a wealth of information to become an extremely successful computational biologist just with publicly available data. It makes a huge difference to have experimental collaborators to work with and to have people who truly deeply understand the biology and the biological questions. Because you could be the best computer scientist in the world, you might be asking the most boring questions in biology. So you have to find partnerships. And I think interdisciplinary collaborations are really at the root of this field. Um, in terms of existing uh, machine learning models, one of my uh, former students, and in fact, one of my high school classmates from France, Julien Gagneur, uh, is the, the classmate whom I knew when I was uh, 15 years old. Um, uh, so Julien has basically gone off to create this tool called, um, he, he mispronounced it, Kipoi, but in, in Greek, it's Kipi. It's the plural of Kipos, which basically means garden. So Kipoi, uh, K-I-P-O-I, is a, a place where people create and store these gardens of machine learning models that are already pre-trained. For, for understanding gene regulation, for example, Kipo is a very wonderful uh, resource where you can go and actually take pre-trained models that you can then apply to these publicly available genomes, publicly available epigenomes, and so on and so forth. So uh, all of that is uh, creating this ecosystem where as an outsider, you can truly come in and make an impact. And I encourage you to number one, uh, listen to my lectures online, to sort of truly understand the, the algorithms behind this. Number two, look for implementations and tools and lectures that really cover more of the pragmatics and logistics of how do I download these data sets and use these data sets, et cetera. And number three, have a blast. <laughs> these data sets are ripe for the reaping. Uh, it's an incredible moment in uh, science where, uh, you know, the field has been cracked open by this incredible amalgamation of technologies. And uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't be happier. I feel like a kid in a candy store. There are so many different jars to pick from and so many different immensely important problems. And you can truly, truly have an impact in bettering human health and the human condition for generations to come. So this is the generation of cracking open the genetic code 
understanding the foundations, the, 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 the circuitry, the code that makes humans run and that make every species in the planet run. And uh, as a human being, it's the uh, ultimate introspection to basically be able to understand the circuitry of the human brain, to be able to understand the circuitry of the human body and the human genome. And uh, you can be part of that journey. All it takes is, uh, you know, drive, hard work, motivation, imagination, and the world is your oyster. With that, thank you all. Thank you so much, Manolis. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, Elise. But Manolis, before we wrap up, uh, where can students find you on maybe social media uh, besides Googling you? Or is Googling you the best uh, way to find you? Yeah, Google. Okay. I don't use any pseudonyms. So just Manolis Kellis, and you find Twitter and Facebook and, you know, I uh, YouTube. Uh, then, you know, there's, I think Google does a pretty good job in putting them in order. So just Google my name and you'll find me. Manolis Kellis, thank you so much. I'll try my Greek. Sas <laughs> efcharisto. And... And we have been so fortunate to have you here. You've been generous with your, with your research. You've been generous of spirit, um, sharing even your home life with us. We really are very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rudolf, I don't know with your first name, whether to say Dankeschön, or with your last name, whether to say Grazie mille. But thank you anyway. Grazie mille, infatti. Prego. Buona notte. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody for thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Anthony. Kalinita. Bye, Elise. Thank you. Good night. Say hi to Sandra. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Yep, we'll, we'll stay out of her. <laughs> All right. Bye, Have, a great, have a great birthday tomorrow for her. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Happy birthday. Yes. Cronio, Cronio Pala. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. Filia. Filia. Ciao.